I'd like to thank you all for joining us this afternoon. The first order of business, please feel free to submit any questions you might have in real time using the chat function of Zoom. My two colleagues, Lauren Derrick and Carl Andrews and I will be monitoring those questions and I will endeavor to ask the questions during the relevant discussion. We plan to reserve some time at the end of the program for additional questions or ones that we weren't able to get to in real time. Secondly, please allow me to introduce the panelists for today's discussion. First, we have Jim Connerman, who's a principal with Altman Weil. He advises law firms on compensation, capital structure, and other economic issues, governance, management, and law firm merger assessments. Jim is also the author of Connerman on Compensation, a blog on lawyer compensation and law firm finance. Next, we have Ryan Hoops from Cushman Wakefield. Brian is a principal leader within Cushman and Wakefield's Legal Sector Advisory Group, which is the leading global practice focused on advising law firms on their corporate real estate. Brian's practice within Cushman and Wakefield represents global, regional, and local law firms across the world and has been ranked number one in tenant representation by the National Law Journal for six years in a row. Next, we have Robin Snyder. Robin is a shareholder with Marshall Dennehy currently serving as the assistant director of the firm's healthcare department based in King of Prussia. Prior to that, Robin worked in the firm's Scranton office as a managing attorney for 15 years. In her current role, Robin is responsible for supporting the day-to-day -day operations and supervision of Marshall's healthcare attorneys. In December, 2012, Robin became a member of the firm's board of directors, serving as a senior vice president until 2018. Next, we have Marie Millie Jones, who's the founding partner of Jones Pasadellas, a boutique litigation and counseling firm in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. She counsels business and public entity clients and risk management principles and handles litigation in federal and state court in the employment and civil rights fields. Ms. Jones served in senior management positions in her prior large law firm. And finally, my name is Kevin Rayfield. I'm a partner with the Petrogallo firm. For several years, I served as the Philadelphia Office Man Administrative Managing Partner. So let's get to it. Panelists, thank you for joining us. The first is an overarching observation for today's discussion, which I believe will be true for all the topics that we will be discussing today. All firms, regardless of size or geographic location, will be asking many of the same questions over the next 12 to 18 months. However, the answers are going to be different for each. We hope that today's discussion will assist all of you, those, all of you who are attending in that process. So Jim, let me just start. Uh, as we move through the pandemic and hopefully come out the other side in short order, what kind of office are we gonna return to based on your discussions with your, law, your national large law firm clients? It's, a, it's an ongoing debate uh, and, and conversation that firms are having internally. And uh, I think the first thing that is, are we going back to a practice and an office configuration that we had pre-pandemic? So are we going back to 2019? Or are we going to come out of this with something that looks different from what we've been doing for the last year and a half or so, uh, and different from 2019? Um, a number of our clients have, have actually surveyed uh, their folks about return to the office, uh, have done it a couple of times through the pandemic at different points, and probably should do it again as we're coming out of it uh, to gauge what the interest and concerns and uh, 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 criteria might be for people in terms of, of return to office. Uh, I think there's a strong urge to always sort of go back to where your comfort zone is, what, what worked and, and worked in the past. Although I think we've been very successful as a profession to um, work remotely, uh, keep clients work moving, even with the constraints of courts and, 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 and other aspects of, of, of moving ahead. Um, it's been a fairly successful pivot. Um, uh, there's, I think, a strong sense that when we come back to the office, uh, the office ought to be something different. So what is our purpose for going back to the office? And things that are relational in nature, I think, come first of all to mind. 
um, mentoring, uh, collaboration, um, uh, training and development, uh, building and maintaining your culture. Uh, those are things that I think people are most highly focused on. They think are most challenged, although there are some laws that were virtual, uh, rem all remote prior to the pandemic. Uh, so there are answers to some of those things. So I think, uh, I think the main thing that we have to do right now is, is to understand exactly how our, how our staff and lawyers uh, feel about it, what their, what their interests and, and, and thoughts are. And well, and start thinking about what does the new office look like if it, if its purpose has changed. If we're not primarily doing work there anymore, and we are coming back for these relational type issues, what does that mean for for how it's set up, how it's designed, how it's organized? Um, so I think that's uh, part of the question as well. well. Thank you, Jim and Ryan. I think that's a nice segue into the question I was going to ask you. I know that. Uh, Cushman and Wakefield sur also server surveys like Altman and Weil firms across the country. What has the surveys that you've been there, that you've been reviewing recently telling you about what law firms are looking for as far as space and what and what their attitudes are about what the new normal will be? Sure. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks to everyone for having me today. Uh, well. We do survey over 700 law firms every year and they're global law firms all the way from the largest law firms in the world to the uh, local law firms. And the, the overarching theme that we have studied and realized is many of the changes that law firms are going through right now when it's related to their workplace strategy are themes and trends that existed and were gaining momentum before the pandemic. So for the last 10 years, we're seeing things like the reduction of the private office size or the amount of square foot per attorney, uh, increased technology spending. What the pandemic did was it served to accelerate many of those trends in tremendous fashion. So that's what we have come to see through our studies over the last 18 months is most of these trends for moving toward a more efficient, a more flexible and a higher quality workspace were there, the pandemic just served to accelerate all of them. Thank you. And is there any attributes, Ryan, that your survey has suggested firms are gonna be looking for or be thinking about as they move and adjust to the post-pandemic era? Sure. Uh, I, I mentioned an important one, looking at the uh, office size strategy, moving more towards single office sizes. Uh, but you know, looking at the overall footprint and the new traffic of these spaces is something that's become a hot topic. More collaboration areas that are tied in with uh, client-facing areas. And you know, we've, we've gone as far as to look at designing uh, the same a program of number of attorneys and number of support staff uh, and laying it out in 30,000 feet and uh, 19,000 feet and in 12,000 feet while fitting the same number of people, but in more flexible and remote work uh, uh, fashion. So looking at items like hoteling and, 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 and how else you can um, function with smaller space. Thank you, Ryan. Robin, as a manager of so many attorneys across so much geographic location, uh, what's your thoughts about the kind of office that uh, your firm will be returning to and firms generally will be returning to once things normalize? I, I do think, Kevin, that it does depend upon the geographic region. Um, what works in Pennsylvania, you know, even Pittsburgh compared to Philadelphia may not work in Florida or in Ohio, which are some of the states that my firm has a presence. I, I believe that you have to adapt to the environment and you know what is going on in those geographic regions while still maintaining a practice that works for your clients and for your law firm as a whole. So the geography definitely will play a part in what happens with uh, the remote workforce. Thank you. So there seems to be, 
even currently, and certainly as we move forward, a tension between the desire for many attorneys and firms, regardless of their generation, to continue to work from home versus the tension of certain clients. And I think of uh, Jamie Dimon's open letter to the Times about how his firm is going to want lawyers back in the office. We're, there's an, there seems to be they're going to have this sort of tension that firms are going to have to manage. So, Jim, you know, what are your thoughts about what firms can think about or how they should be approaching uh, handling or addressing this, this apparent tension as we move into the post-pandemic era? Well, I, I don't want to overstate or understate that somewhat infamous letter at this Jim, point. Jim, can you just sure. move a little I, closer? I, I don't want to overstate or understate that, that somewhat infamous letter. Um, it's, I'm not hearing that demand from managing partners when I talk to them. They're not saying that their clients have demanded that they get back to the office and demanded in-person meetings and, and conferences. Um, actually, if, I, if I'm thinking about it, I'm probably hearing more where managing partners saying, you know, our clients really are not all too keen on us coming back out to see them and being in their and being in their offices. They said we're we're very comfortable working with you in in a remote situation. So I think you have to be. I, I think you have to just you know, as, as as Robin was saying, be flexible in terms of of how you respond geographically. Also, be flexible in terms of how you deal with each client. If a client needs you to be have more face to face interaction uh, together. Uh, then, then uh, figure out how that's going to happen, when it's going to happen, and so forth. And then uh, if other clients really, really don't want to go in that direction, want to stay remote, um, uh, you know, plan your service for them around that as the, as the foundational element. So I think you're just responsive to, to their particular needs and situations. Um, and really going back to this question, what's the purpose? So going back to the office, what's the purpose to go back to the office? And the office fits and, 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 and meets that purpose. Same thing with your clients. What's the purpose of getting together? And is that the most efficient use of your time and resources and our time and resources and, and, and work it through? Thank you, Jim. Marie, your thoughts on that question? Sure. Um, great to be with everybody uh, and to uh, participate today. Um, you know, will client demands uh, make decisions for the lawyers and the law firms? My answer to that short answer is yes. <laughs> um, you know, if our clients need something, want something a certain way, I think we work hard to accommodate that if we can. Um, I think then it becomes a balancing act. Um, and to, to be frank, I would, I would suggest being upfront with the clients about it. You know, if they're making a particularized demand about being in person, or as Jim says, many are saying, don't come here, um, then discuss that. Does that work for the issue, the matter for which you're working with that client? Do you need to be there for that client, even if the client says, I don't want you to come? Uh, you know, de certain depositions, certain mediations, certain negotiations, for example. Uh, uh, on the other side of that, if the matter and the client say, we do want you here, and you have concerns for whatever reason, the safety of your lawyers, um, the nature of the industry in which that client works, that you wouldn't want your lawyers to be there, then I think you have that conversation with them very uh, candidly. But, you know, for the most part, I would think that we always try, don't we, to get our clients to yes, right, when they're asking for something. So I think we will work with them and just try to assess how um, their needs and our firm's preferences can uh, work together so that we can all you know get to the right answer. Thank you, Marie. Robin, your thoughts? I, I agree with that. I do think that you know it's dependent upon all the players in the equation. So you know are we talking about we, we need to consider what is best for the clients, what is best for our workforce, what is best for the firm in general? Um, you know, Theoretically, all of those things match up and you can get to one correct answer, but uh, or one answer that works for all. But, you know, sometimes the there is tension in terms of, you know, what the firm believes is best for 
the firm as a whole versus what a client will want versus what an, an employee wants. I think Ryan said before, um, you know, this pandemic got us forward quicker or uh, than, you know, we were expecting. I think remote work, I've read studies that remote work was sort of the trend. Uh, Marshall Dunahy had a rem remote work policy before the pandemic, which allowed our attorneys to work from home two days a week, as long as, you know, certain things were met. Um, but the pandemic has forced that forward a little bit. And I think, um, you know, there's going to be a tension between all of the, the various players that we just have to try to balance. So it seems from everyone's responses that there seems to be some concurrence that this continuing work from a home model is going to be here for the long haul. So the question I would have for all of you then is what do you think the, this hybrid work model is going to look like, not now, as we still are dealing with restrictions from COVID, but after that, right, when there are no restrictions, hopefully, but firms are still addressing the desire for their attorneys across all generations to remain at home and work. So what, what is that model going to look like generally and what and, and how will firms figure out how they're going to address that model and the needs of the firm and the attorneys? So Jim, can you start us off? Sure. I think the I think there's going to be a tremendous amount of flexibility in whatever comes out of this. Some of the things that we already talked about, geographic differences that may be that may be important, um, but also um, practice specific differences. Uh, some teams may need to collaborate more at particular times um, than others. So uh, I, I think each team is going to have to look at when should we be together? When is it really not necessary for us to be together? Um, there's a, you know, there's sort of an economic benefit to working from home. Most of the studies that I've looked at and, and, and or heard of have, have said that, that work from home has been a productivity improvement not a, a distraction. People learn how to, how to intermesh their, their personal and business activities in a fairly effective and efficient way. Um, and you don't have the commute, uh, which for some people can be an hour or two each way. Uh, so you're thinking maybe you know, two to four hours a day trying to get between the workplace and home. Uh, when that goes away, that can be spent for more billable time, it can be spent for more personal time. It can be, you know, a mix of the two. Uh, so I think it's, uh, I think it's going to be flexible. Where where the firms are going to have to craft policies that have enough, enough breadth to them, uh, that the teams that need to be together more often will do that. The teams that don't need to be together as often um, uh, will not be, and that those designed workspaces, the collaboration spaces that Ryan was speaking about. Um, you have to think about now if we're compressing the footprint, um, now we have to be more conscious about who's in on what days and who isn't because we can't have everybody descend on Monday morning if we've designed a place for hoteling where only you know 30% are supposed to be in at any given time. Uh, so you know it will be a conscious of who needs to be in, when are they going to be in, how does the space accommodate for them. Uh, so there'll be some uh, some scheduling and, and administrative uh, 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 backdrop to this that has to be put into place. And Robin, in, in your current position, how do you see this sort of hybrid work model going and uh, sort of the managerial and administrative tasks that will be required? I, I agree that it's here to stay. I don't think that we're going back to a situation where we're in the office five days a week. Um, I, I think that it is a... Um, uh, something that needs to continue to be flexible as we move forward. Certainly, you know, it, it, employees, depending on the, the level of the employee, we need people in the office um, so that new attorneys, for example, can be mentored. And um, we need people in the office so that we can maintain our culture of, you know, uh, sharing ideas and and bouncing ideas off of one another, and I mean that across 
the board, you know, uh, most senior attorneys to junior attorneys. And I think that it, um, some of it will fall in the hands of, you know, individual lawyers and their individual teams. But I do think that if there will be some management oversight of making sure things are flowing correctly and that people aren't f falling through the cracks, so to speak, if they are working remotely too often or, you know, not having enough contact um, within the office as a whole. Thank you, Robin. And Marie, your thoughts on that question? Um, I think great points so far. I think the key word we're going to hear today uh, from all of us is flexibility. I truly believe post pandemic, it's going to be flexible, but, but I would get a venture, a guess of more in than out of the office. Um, I, I agree, however, that the management responsibilities that Robin was referencing are going to become more critical and that there will be a greater level of administrative oversight to address, manage, and ensure you know, the, the productivity of the lawyers as well as their uh, happiness, frankly, uh, in terms of their jobs uh, with this flexible atmosphere. So you know, that's gonna create some level of burden on the, on the administrative and management teams um, and that, you know, which will also be potentially things like cost more money for technology and other issues that you'll have to address. So, you know, I, I think there will be more of that required to accommodate the flexibility that the future will bring. Thank you, Marie. So Ryan, next question is to you. And uh, you said some very interesting uh, things about the law firm real estate needs. Uh, I would just ask you uh, without dwelling overly much. Um, the, when law firms are designing their space, um, based on your work to date and your discussions with your clients, are firms opting more to, to outward client, outward facing physical space with a work from home component, component and hoteling? Like where are firms landing? And I'd be curious to know, based on your experience, whether the, to the extent law firms are reducing their physical size, what kind of impact that's having on the profitability of the firm and whether that in the future will drive physical space decisions. So to focus on the first part of your question, the client facing aspects, you know, the last 18 months have really been um, more of looking at uh, instituting band-aids on the real estate situation. So mm -hmm. there has been a, a, a bigger focus on how are my attorneys and employees going to be working over the next 18, 24 months? Then what does our long-term workplace strategy look like? We're just now entering though the phase of talking about design of the space for, okay, when we bring clients back into the space, because we're not really there yet uniformly across the board, you know, where, where are they going to be in the space and how are we going to interact with them? And we've seen a couple of recent examples of law firms looking at uh, separate space from the practice areas. So, so, for example, having a first floor element that has the client facing areas, meeting rooms, amenities, uh, and then having the practice floor where the attorneys are on a different floor, like the second floor. In fact, we just went through that exercise for a law firm in Canada. Um, but the other, the, the, the bigger trend we're seeing is the combination of the workplace amenities. So think of the break area, the, the lounge, the collaboration spaces for the attorneys and the employees being interwoven with the client facing areas. So spending a lot of your dollars on the improvement of the space in that part of the area to one, elevate the feel of the space and the experience of your employees and your attorneys who want to go to those areas, but also still having a really good impression when your clients are coming to the space. So from a design standpoint, that's what we're seeing is the meshing of those two elements, collaboration and amenity spaces with client facing areas. Uh, from a profitability standpoint to the second part of your question, 
Uh, that is one of the most preeminent parts of our strategy is looking at reducing real estate costs while remaining in, in, in while maintaining a competitive balance. And what that means in the real estate world is it still is incredibly advantageous to be in high quality trophy asset buildings from a recruitment and retention standpoint to a brand standpoint for a lot of these law firms. Um, but you know, those are expensive. So when you look at how can we strategically reduce our footprint to be more efficient while being in those same high quality assets and still reducing our real estate costs and what kind of profitability does that drive back to the firm? We actually run that analysis for every requirement that we have now with a law firm looking at what is their current square footage per attorney in a particular office and looking at where their inefficiencies are, driving efficiencies, and then showing the partners what does that mean to your bottom line and profitability. Um, so profitability is at the very, very top of one of the considerations that we make from a real estate standpoint. Thank you, Ryan. So I think that let's move on from place and let's talk about what I think is the greatest asset of any firm that's people. So we've touched a little bit upon this in the opening questions, but I'd like to drill a little bit more down. But let's start with how are firms going to retain, attract, and engage their workforces in this hybrid work model that we've been discussing, and I think we all agree is here to stay, um, in, in a way that the teams can uh, conduct the practice of law at a high level but that the firms can also, as Robin pointed out, inculcate their culture, or as Marie pointed out, train and mentor their younger attorneys so that you're creating that continued quality product. So I'll start with uh, Marie. Sure. Um, I guess I'd say as an overarching theme, you have to be very purposeful when it comes to this area, um, particularly in these uh, current times and in times that will be, you know, a little uncertain uh, as to whether they will look the same as they used to look. Um, and, you know, starting with the hiring of people who had to be brought on board during a pandemic when you couldn't even get to the office to somebody who may have been new to the team, uh, but not for a very long time before they had to leave and not interact with people. Uh, to those of us that were around for a while and, uh, and just, you know, didn't get to see everybody the way we normally would see everybody. So I think you have to be purposeful to engage with people. You have to listen. I think what they're telling you is important and what they might need uh, in a way that maybe we weren't uh, thinking about listening for in the past. Um, you know, maybe that's things like uh, you, you know, uh, assigning somebody to new lawyers in a way that will ensure they are interacting with people if they're not in the office. Um, you know, sending out more emails that might be, you know, cheerleading of a, of a nature that where you're, you know, really trying to make everybody feel good about the atmosphere and the, and the team. Um, you know, maybe doing some um, vir virtual meetings on a regular basis to ensure that people can engage with each other um, on work-related things or even social type things and, and just um, really be thoughtful and um, uh, taking aggressive uh, affirmative steps to make people be able to interact with each other when it was so easy in the past to just walk down the halls and, and say hello or have a cup of coffee with someone. Thank you, Marie. Robin? I agree with that wholeheartedly. And, you know, we are all different people by nature. So if you're in the office and you're walking down the hall and you see someone's door closed every single day, it may be that they are just somebody who likes to hide behind that closed door. But that's something that you, you know, in management can see because it's physically in front of you. If the person is not physically in the office, you know, the people who have those personalities that um, are not outgoing necessarily w may tend to hide. And um, th that doesn't mean they're not going to be successful in your place of business, but it takes a little bit of extra effort on the 
part of management to make sure that you're addressing the needs of all the people in your organization and in a different sort of way. It's not as easy um, to know what people are doing if they're not physically, you know, in the, the inside the four walls of the building, so to speak. Um, and so I think it takes just a little extra effort and different, a different way of management. And thank you, Robin. And Jim, from the law firm consultant perspective, what input would you have for us here? You know, I think about if, if this pandemic had happened at the turn of the last decade, 10 years, you know, a decade ago, that pivot probably wouldn't have been as successful. We didn't have the technology infrastructure to do what we've done over the last year and a half on a remote basis. It just didn't exist. Mm -hmm. um, so the tools have come a long, long way, and I think they will continue to, to go a long way. Um, many of us have, have learned new social skills over the last year and a half. And how do we interact? No, I'm, I'm serious. Interacting socially in a digital format is different than when you're right there in person. Um, some people are very camera shy and, and maybe to pick up on, on Robin's point, more camera, sh more shy and, and maybe concerned and drawn back um, in a digital environment than they might even be in the office environment because the digital can be a bit imposing to some people. Uh, so I think it's, it's, it's giving, a, um, giving people enough opportunity to interact in both environments now that they feel comfortable in both. So using these tools and using them in, 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 in creative ways. Continue the, um, some firms doing what they call social hour type events digitally that they used to do in the office. We'll keep on doing those as we come out of the pandemic. So let's, let's keep the, the comfort that we've gotten with those, but now you can maybe intermix them with some things that are in the office or maybe do office and digital where they're intermeshed together. So some people who can't be in the office but still want to participate in the event that's going on, live stream it. You know, make it a, a an event like this where they can they can be on a screen and participating with their colleagues and friends who are who are uh, physically present. Um, I, I think that's a, a sort of a uh, an approach that's going to be attractive to people who can say, you know, if I can't be there in person, I can be there digitally. I can still be a part of what's going on and be a and and, and build the relationships with my colleagues. I have a question from the audience, uh, which I'll paraphrase. Mm -hmm. That you know, there's been some discussion about getting feedback from the attorneys and, and administrative staff and assistants. Mm -hmm. uh, what tool or how would you recommend that be done in a way that's efficient and gets back quality information? Uh, Jim. Yeah, I think that can be. You know, you can. Uh, don't want to promote a particular product, but it's the one that, that I see used the most often, SurveyMonkey. I mean, it's real easy to set up a, a, a survey uh, on that basis. If you feel more comfortable, some firms have actually asked some an independent party to conduct the survey for them. And, and I'm not looking for people to come to us to ask us to conduct those surveys, by the way. It's just that some people feel that their workforce will be more comfortable giving honest answers is particularly if there's some narrative. If it's not going to be seen, the individual responses aren't going to be seen by the management of the firm. If they can just see, if they know that, look, the CPA firm or the, or the, or the, or the uh, um, surveying firm, whoever's going to conduct this, they will see the data, they will, they will clean it up, they will produce the report, they will discuss the report with management, uh, and, and that's an effective tool to do it. Um, I'm not opposed to, to getting small groups together digitally uh, to have conversations. That might be a next step. You might get a report and you say, you know, I see five themes here that I would like to have some conversations with people to take them further. And they can handle those internally. That's when you can open it up and have management present because now you've got something that you can build around uh, in a positive way, not as a, a someone is fearful of, of, of being open about what their concerns what their limitations might be because they're concerned about their, their job and their status. Thank you, Jim. Kevin, I, I'd like to just piggyback on that for just one moment. Um, you know, uh, one of the biggest challenges we find when it comes to surveying um, 
it actually goes back to the very first book my mentor bought me when I told him that I wanted to work on law firm real estate. It, it, the, the title of the book was the, the first myth of law firm consensus is that it exists. <laughs> so that was the first lesson was you have to drive consensus and your point about third party surveying and third party intelligence it has been a very powerful uh, tool that we've implemented with clients and uh, we've done it in two ways it's doing the surveying knowing how to ask the right questions and it's not just about the real estate it's about the business and the functions and and and, and the workplace uh, but also having you know, live, to Jim's point, live conversations and pre presenting the latest trends and the latest movements toward these workplace strategies that we're talking about uh, to all the partners and the stakeholders of a particular firm so that the leadership can help drive consensus around some of these themes. Uh, so, you know, we, we surveyed everyone, here's what we found. And it was a third party group that did the survey and, and presented to everyone uh, so that you help drive consensus. So anyway, I just wanted to add that, 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 that we're doing a lot of that. And Ryan, actually, again, apropos, a question from the audience. Ryan, when and how was your survey conducted? So in, in two ways we've done them. We have a tool that's actually called, again, I'm not promoting, I'm sorry, but we have a tool <laughs> called Experience Per Square Foot that uh, it's a tool that it's proprietary to our firm that we're able to load up with all the strategic questions that we know to ask and we work with firm leadership and we get distributed to all the attorneys and the staff. Uh, and we aggregate the feedback and we present the real results to either firm leadership or in the more powerful instances to all the stakeholders. And during that presentation, we've actually done live polling as well. Mm -hmm. uh, where we will ask questions real time to the audience members. Uh, and again, this is just for one particular firm. So there may be, we have an instance where there's 16 partners on the phone. We had another where there was 40. So uh, it, those are the two methods of delivery. It's the, you know, here's the survey, everyone fills it out and we aggregate the results. The other form is it's a live presentation. We do live polling during the presentation and then uh, show the results real time to everyone that's on the call. And, and I've got to tell you, the, the chief operating officers for these firms love it <laughs> because it takes, it takes the answer out of their hand and, and, and um, uh, it, it, it's coming from a third party source. And I'd like to just add one other point because I think this is important for anyone who wants to do this. If you ask people to participate in a study, um, like the one that Ryan just described. Make sure you give feedback to everybody who participated or every, all the groups that were asked to participate because when, when people give you information, they take the time, the, 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 the 20 to 30 minutes that most of these uh, studies require to, to uh, provide the responses. Um, it, it's not only just a courtesy, but if you wanna go back to them again and have them participate in more of these things, they, you need to give them feedback and say, this is what we learned. This is what we're going to do with what we learned. Um, and that gives people a much better impression about, about the study overall, about firm leadership. And also uh, you're gonna drive higher participation in future uh, endeavors such as that. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, Robin, I would like to circle back uh, and just ask you the same question I asked Marie, because I'd like to get your thoughts and input um, from a large law firm, multiple office perspective of how do you foresee the, um, the inculcating of the culture and the training uh, in that kind of setting? Well, considering the remote um, setting, this sort of piggybacks on what we were saying before, you know, um, mentoring and training is vitally important. Um, and it's being, it has to be done. Management has to consider how it can be done in the format that we're currently living in. So, um, you know, whereas it was, you know, tr 
typical to have younger associates go to, let's say, motions court or come along for a deposition with things being conducted by Zoom technology um, in some jurisdictions where individuals are not permitted to watch what, it, what other arguments are going on in the courtroom, it's more difficult to get people experience. And so um, on the other hand, you know, the remote environment allow, makes it easier in some ways to get experience, but there has to be a, um, a more guided approach to it to make sure it's happening. Um, you know, we're gonna have another a generation of lawyers coming up now and you know behind us um that it, you know it will be trained in a substantially different way than we were trained but it needs to happen with purpose um so that you're ensuring that those those individuals are being trained um and you know with regard to uh the side of uh, training other than education, you know, we want to mentor young associates and bring people along, as we talked about before, um, so that they know about the culture of the firm and they want to become invested and they want to stay and, you know, become shareholders and become the future leaders of the firm. And you're not going to do that unless you can find ways to continue mentoring them, even if they're not in a physical workplace, you know, 24 seven, so to speak. So one of the things that jumps out at me is, you know, we talked about flexibility and, and purpose and mentoring and training and working as teams. There are some practice areas that are gonna require younger attorneys to be in the office more often than other practice areas just by the nature of the work, right? Certain trial work, certain business, you know, mergers and acquisitions is is a hybrid work model where associates can or attorneys can choose to work from home going to create some sort of disparate process by which some associates who by the nature of the work are in the office more and have more face-to-face -face contact are going to be mentored better or advanced quicker than attorneys whose work would normally keep them at home more often. Is that an issue that we need to be thinking about and figuring out how to address? Um, Jim, you're shaking your head, so I'll start yeah. with you. Okay. Yeah, I think in the short run, that is a likely result. Um, we have to be much more mindful and, and, and create the opportunities to be present when we're here digitally. Um, and things that would happen where you would just poke your head in an office and grab somebody and say, let's go have a, a, a chat. There's a client in the office, I'd like to introduce you and so on. And you could do that on a spur of the moment. Um, you can still do that digitally, but it takes a, an, an extra step or two. You can't just poke your head in the office. You gotta, you gotta reach out to them and, and hopefully they're available just like you hope that they were in the office so that they could participate in in the meeting or the call or whatever that's that's taking place, um, so yeah, I think the, I think in the short run, our comfort and our skill at mentoring and developing people and being including them, is is in the office. It's doing it that way. That's what we grew up with. That's what we know. That's where our comfort zone is. Um, so in the short run, I think yeah, there's a likelihood that people who are in a more of a digital environment, less in present are gonna be at a bit of a disadvantage. I think that can go away if we're thoughtful about how we do this and develop the digital side of this in a more robust way. And Marie, you look anxious to answer that question. Yeah, no, I actually, I, I agree. And it's, I thought it was a great point, Kevin. Um, I think there is a risk of that. Uh, it's a risk that I think management and administrative uh, lawyers in the firm have to be cognizant of. I think you calling it out is a great point for people to start thinking about how to be prepared for that potential uh, conflict that could occur among teams. Um, I think practice group leaders have that responsibility to um, address this concern front and center. 
Um, you know, G Jim, I, I do what you've just described and I've now in the times of the pandemic done it more than mm -hmm. I used to. You know, I schedule a call with a client, uh, you know, depending on the level of the matter, but for the most part, almost always now have somebody else on that call because it creates a better opportunity for them to learn. It ensures the client knows there's people available if I'm not there, but it, you know, which is sort of the old reason we did it. <laughs> but yeah. the new reason is to help, uh, in addition to that, it, to help the, the other lawyer, maybe the younger or less experienced lawyer. Um, and so those are things that we do have to purposefully consider um, and make sure that we're not forgetting about um, in, in terms of their, their development and you know the parity among the lawyers within the firm, and those can be difficult uh, issues to address. So, agree, Robin. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And you know, going back to what we were talking about before, you have the personality of the people involved. You know, um, the person working uh, in the office may be the maybe an introvert who doesn't really want to be in the office all the time, and is sort of jealous of you know the other team that. Uh, you know, is, is working from home. Um, so I, it, you know, you have to try to manage that as well. I don't think any of this, that part is different than what we've done as in management, you know, pre pandemic. I just think that, um, because we have to focus on our workforce, it just gets highlighted. It has gotten highlighted more through the pandemic. So for large law firms, I can just envision, we, we typically might ask, where would you like to work? Which office? What practice area are you interested in, in terms of area of law? And would you like it to be an in-person or digital experience? <laughs> <laughs> when I first started at Marshall Dennehy in the Scranton office, I was told, we're not moving you out of Scranton. You're being hired for Scranton. <laughs> okay. And <now laughs> here I sit in King <laughs> Prussia. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we, we, we hear all the time now from our clients that uh, firms are calling on their attorneys and saying, hey, you can work from home in Austin, Texas, but you'll be working on projects and, you know, so many other markets. We just have to work. We need the people. You can work from home, stay where you are. So we hear that a lot from our law firm clients as well. Yeah, that's been a, that's been a driving factor in a lot of the uh, lateral marketplace, in particular amongst the associates. Firms realize... I don't need to have you in New York City or Los Angeles or Chicago or wherever they happen to be located. I can, I, I'm just going to dial you in. All I have to do is ship you the, the tools, plug you in, and off we go. But at the same time, on that note, you know, just in Pennsylvania, the way the, um, the COVID, you know, pandemic was handled, so to speak, was so different. Um, you know, we found that uh, the remote work policy in our Pittsburgh office was, was favored, um, whereas in Philadelphia, because many companies did not come back to work, still have not come back to work, and Marshall Dennehy came back to work in Pennsylvania on May 3rd, that, um, you know, it was disfavored in Philadelphia, and that's just... Pennsylvania. Um, mm -hmm. So in other words, why should we have to come back to the office? People wanted to continue to work remotely instead of just being given the opportunity to work remotely two days a week. And, well, here's a, a question from, the, from an audience member, uh, and, and I'll paraphrase. Uh, what kind you know, is or post pandemic, is there going to be a one uniform policy, employment policies across a firm with geographical locations in many states? Or is post-pandemic going to show or uh, lead to sort of policies based on office and proclivities of the attorneys in those offices? Um, Robin? I, I don't um, pretend to create the policies within my firm, but I do not see us having individualized policies. I think that they may be interpreted differently and implemented differently in the different geographic regions, but I think the policy will be consistent throughout. So it will have to be something that can work in all the jurisdictions. 
And as an employment lawyer, <laughs> I would suggest <laughs> that you have uniform policies, understanding, as Robin has indicated, that there can be a particular office that has to do something one way that another office simply couldn't do. But um, that still allows that office to have the policy or the practice, let's call it, while the firm has an overarching policy. And, so, and isn't, you know, isn't that cons Marie, isn't that consistent with what we see already where multi-state firms and multinational firms have overarching policies, but they also have policies right. that conform to state employment rules or right. national employment rules in other countries? Agree. All right, so here's another question from an audience. I'll ask it of Jim and Ryan first, but then follow up with Robin and Marie, because um, you know, the question is more of a survey-based question. Jim and Ryan, for the surveys that you've done or the clients with whom you've worked, um, have you gotten any feedback about what the associate, you know, associate attorney's top two or three major concerns are, uh, not just currently, but in the future? Ryan, you want to go first? Uh, short answer is yes. Um, in fact, I have that list somewhere. I'm sorry, I didn't anticipate that question. It's a very good one. Uh, but yes, we, we have a very robust associate um, survey. So uh, I can kind of give you some anecdotes. So associates, for the most part, are a reflection, uh, or the, the, the attorneys at the associate level for the most part are a reflection of um, a lot of the younger generation within the workforce going through this pandemic. Our surveys have found that while they are the segment that has been uh, you know, most vocal about wanting to remain in a remote working environment, again, this is not a uniform comment, but it's, it's, it's a majority, um, they are actually the group that has been most affected and ne negatively affected by remote working environments. Um, and you've touched on a lot of the topics that you can imagine within a law firm. Um, and, 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 and back to how we've been working the last 18 months, law firms from our studies have found that most anything that's transactional or linear in nature uh, can get done very effectively in a remote working setting. But what you miss out on and where our studies have shown the issues have been are areas like mentorship, succession planning, as an example, vaulted to the number two concern of the law firms we surveyed, the 700 law firms we surveyed, um, business development, creativity, uh, a lot of the, the, the aspects that associates really need from our understanding and our studies uh, they're, they're missing out on from the remote working environment. So while they do respond that they, you know, a priority is being able to work remotely, uh, it's, it's, it, it, it is um, turned into a negative uh, or a, a, it has affected them negatively in a lot of circumstances. Uh, but I'll tell you so, something that's interesting too is, is we found that you know, while of course compensation um, has has always remained near the top of the associate concern ladder, uh, that uh, collaboration and culture have been incredibly important to them in in, in our recent studies, our, our our recent surveys. That that those aspects are, you know, right behind compensation. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, I. I think it's the, the, the bundle of things that go into relational topics and issues, um, which is the, the mentorship, the training, the culture. Um, Jim, feeling sorry, part can you just of, speak up a little bit? Feeling, feeling part of a team, um, uh, getting the type of training, getting the feedback on their, on their work and, and, and work product. Uh, those tend to be the more challenging aspects from their perspective. Um, the technical aspects of doing the work, you know, the tools that they have in their home are just as good as the tools that they have in the office. They can access the same database, they can access the same files, they can, um, they, they're comfortable sharing work product and working on work product 
together at the same time in the digital format. So the technical aspects haven't been a big driver for them uh, generally, um, uh, but the relational aspects of 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 their their uh, uh, portion their 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 position within the firm and they're being feeling like they're a part of a team. Those have been challenged. The more more they feel more isolated when they're when they're working digitally. Although uh, I think it's an interesting contrast because if I remember pre-pandemic when we used to be out and about in restaurants all the time, uh, I would look at younger people out at a restaurant uh, having drinks and dinner together and not talking to each other. <laughs> or if they were, they were doing it, they were doing the a little phone out doing da, 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 da. And I'm going like, okay, this is interesting. And then I'm kind of in the back of my mind taking that experience and saying overlay. And yet they're concerned about the relational aspects of being <laughs> isolated and we're working re remotely. And I'm thinking it's it, it's an interesting, you know, obviously I can't, I can't, I don't know what those what those people were lawyers or, or what, what they were doing or anything like that. But I found it, it, it sort of a, a, an interesting insight into people might be more comfortably from a social setting, non-work setting to be digitally connected through social media and all those kinds of platforms. But they may be less so when their career is on the line mm -hmm. and, and, and they're in the work setting. So I think that kind of dichotomy exists there and we should be mindful of it. We should play to the, you can do this socially and digitally. You do it on social platforms, social media, all, all the time. We can slide, if we can slide that over into the work setting in a professional way, an appropriate way, then um, that might help us with some of the relational issues that, are, that exist out there. But that also means more robust technology platforms for the people to interact within the confines of their network and particularly for lawyers who are often having conversations that have to be well protected from outside ears because they're talking about clients and protected information. So again, it's somewhat unique for law that doesn't exist in other settings, but I, I, I think the opportunity is there. And uh, Marie and Robin, from a management perspective, um, what's your thoughts about what you know now your associate, uh, associates really value and what you think they will be valuing in another, hopefully six months when we're moving on the other side of this. Marie? Um, yeah, I'd say I've, I've learned uh, that the associates uh, don't wanna miss out on opportunities. And those might be work opportunities, they might be client facing opportunities, they might be social opportunities with the firm. So they don't wanna miss out but then they sort of struggle or balance that against really liking the ability and the flexibility mm -hmm. to not always be in the office or not always be in the same um, spot. So I think it is a, you know, the sort of scales of justice, the balancing act um, that we have to uh, perform. But I have seen uh, kind of the, I, you know, I don't want to be left behind. I don't want to miss out, but, I kind of like that. So <laughs> again, I feel like that just puts more on the management team uh, to just be paying more attention yeah. to, to not let somebody slip through the cracks and also make sure they're engaged. So I'm not sure that's black and white, yeah. but I think it's the reality of what I've noticed. <laughs> when, I, when I worked in an office, my commute was 45 minutes each way. Mm -hmm. My commute to now is 45 seconds. <laughs> I kind of like that. Yeah. <laughs> And I think it's generational because I, I get that. I, I get the differences that we see. So. Thank you, Maureen. Robin? I, 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 I agree. And, you know, um, I think there is a much bigger focus on work-life balance. Um, not that, you know, any of us do not want to have our uh, life in balance with our work, but, you um, you know, we just, it, it's front and center now and management has to figure out how that is going to, you know, um, affect policies and affect how we conduct our business as, as we go forward. Um, I, I don't think it's an easy answer to the question, uh, but it is a question, you know, what, what can we do to continue to keep our people happy and 
you know, keep them wanting to work in a productive way. Yeah, and you know, as you bring up the work-life balance, um, and I see somebody maybe raising a, a comment or question, if you know, some of us might say, well, isn't remote work from home a better balance? Because you can, as this group talked about in preparation for today's program, you know, stop, go take care of something at the home front and come back. And that's great. Um, so I, I tend to believe it does give the opportunity for balance. The, the problem is, do we now feel like we're 24 seven on? Um, and you know that's not necessarily balanced at all. <laughs> and it's also not necessarily good from an employment law standpoint. <laughs> so you know, there's a lot of reasons that can be a, a troublesome uh, sign of the remote you know, working from home um, situation. So, and, and that actually brings, this discussion leads to another point, which is there, it seems, there, there's an inclination to think that there's a generational divide on this work from home question. You know, that younger people are more comfortable being home and older people are more inclined to be at the office. But what I hear you all saying, and I think what I've observed myself is that there is no set way, set desire by generation. That's really a people, a person driven issue rather than a generational issue. I mean, is that a fair assessment of what you've seen? Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 had, so. I had a managing partner tell me uh, in the midst of the pandemic that one of their big 800 pound gorilla rainmakers who believed that um, you know, a seven day work week in the office was appropriate, um, called up and said, you never get me back in the office. <laughs> I don't want to commute. Uh, I'm just as happy being at home. I can I can go out and, and connect with anybody I want just as easily here as I can someplace else. And it was actually sort of a stunning change of thinking from that particular individual. And that's just one example, but I've heard that enough times to say, this is interesting. Um, it's not it, it's it's not locked in by generation because we've also heard of some associates that really would like to get back in the office and that's what the surveys the the surveys are not giving you the stereotypical answers that you want that any of us probably would have expected at the outset of this we're getting a much more nuanced and complex set of answers which means that our response is complicated by that and we have to we're, we're going to have to be the, we're going to have to take the time to say, how do we address this uniformly and consistently across our organization, but provide the flexibility that, you know, what works for Jane works for Joe. What works in Dallas works in Chicago. What works in, in, in trial works in m and And that's, it, it's a more nuanced and complicated than sort of the first blush that we all kind of quickly go to when we're thinking about this. Right. So we're going to move on to client development and business development in a moment. There's one last question in the people category that I wanted to discuss. So, you know, equity, diversity and inclusion, wellness, mindfulness, work-life balance, that's all been a big part of firm uh, thought process and, and focus um, for, as far as retention and, and attracting talent. Do you see any of that changing in the next 12 to 18 months? Pro the process for it being done differently, um, you know, the, the desires for attorneys for those things to uh, evolve? Uh, who wants to feel that one? Robin That's, uh, or uh, Marie, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just going to say, I'll start just by saying, I think uh, it's one of those items that we've been talking about that you have to be really careful to pay attention to. Um, you know, so many firms have done great things in the, um, you know, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion area. And uh, when you're not together and not observing people and seeing who's who and, and where they are and what they're doing, and, you know, are we meeting those, those needs, um, you have to spend time thinking about it and making sure you're not letting it slide. Um, and so, you know, that's another way, another area where I think we have to be very, very careful and purposeful uh, because such great progress is being made, but you don't want to let it go the wrong direction. Robin? 
I completely agree. You know, we, we as an industry, I think have made a lot of progress and I think that we have to continue to focus. It's not, it's not easy to do. And, you know, to go back to an earlier point, um, you know, sometimes we don't know what we have or, or don't know what we were missing until we have it. So like, you know, um, people didn't realize that their commute was so bad until they didn't have to commute, um, <laughs> you know, it, because they were so used to it their entire life, you know, they're, they grow up around traffic and <laughs> until Jim moved to Florida, he didn't <laughs> realize it could, be, it could be any different, um, you know, and I, I think that, uh, you know, it just, we just have to continue a focus and make sure that we're paying attention to all the very important DEI issues and um, making sure that our teams continue to be a team and our you know firms continue to work together so that you know we exist in years to come. All right, so let's move then to clients, which I think is the lifeblood of, besides our people, the lifeblood of a firm. Um, so, you know, there was a way of developing business pre-COVID that has changed significantly over the last 16 months. So what are your impressions, either from your personal experience, Robin and Marie, or from what your clients are telling you, Jim and Ryan, about what business development is gonna look like once we're through the COVID and regulations have been lifted and people are working in a hybrid fashion, right? Are we gonna revert back to the lunch, dinner, you know, in-person and speaking engagements or do you see business development being something different? Um, Robin. I think you're gonna have a hybrid. Um, I think we're going to have some clients who want us in person and some clients who are comfortable having us, you know, participate remotely, whether it's by video or, or phone. Um, and I mean, I think we saw a little bit of the, you know, sort of restriction on um, telephone communication when email became so hot, you know, everybody wants to email as opposed to speak. And so this is just a, a different, you know, adaption um, that I think will take place. And I do think it's going to be completely dependent upon the client and the, and the event. What, you know, going back to the word purpose, what is the purpose for the meeting? You know, does it have to be in person? Can it take place remotely? And what is the best answer for that particular situation? Thank you, Robin. Marie? Um, you know, client development, business development is about building relationships. And so we have to figure out the best way to maintain or build new relationships with clients in the, in the post-pandemic world. Um, I can still see using in-person events, particularly now as a way to say, oh, it'll be so great to get together finally, <laughs> um, you know. Uh, you know, take take a client to a hockey game, uh, take them to a dinner and a show. Uh, you know, I can see that continuing. Uh, you know, I sent some emails today to schedule some holiday lunches. You know, we're going to try and do that when we can and when the clients are comfortable because you want to interact and, and continue to build those relationships. Uh, but I think there are different ways to do that now, and we've seen those work. You know, we've all participated in um, uh, programs that were virtual where maybe there was a wine tasting involved or some other kind of socializing via Zoom or Teams. And it was a lot of fun and it was a great way to connect. And so it's, it's just another method of building that relationship. Um, I think that the speaking like this, if it's not in person is, is another way to do it, but it's, it, it's still a speaking event. You still can write articles. Those methods can continue, um, but it just has to be um, maybe tweaked a little uh, once in a while to adapt to the changing environment. Jim? Uh, I think that's spot on. The, um, the thing that I would add is that when I'm hearing from the corporate side is that, you know, they spent, just like the legal profession, they, they spent the last year and a half 
redesigning their business processes and rethinking how they operate their business when they couldn't be in person. Now, some things, of course, you know, you can't manufacture a product if you're not there. You can't, you know, you can't deliver health care to someone who's sick if you're not in presence. So, you know, it, it varies from, from, from situation to situation. The one thing that has come up is that I'm hearing very serious conversations about rethinking about all of this. All, and this is probably probably the last thing that the airlines and the hotels and the uh, uh, want to hear is that a significant proportion of the travel budgets of corporations are unnecessary. Okay. They don't serve a necessary business purpose given the advancement of tools like this um, and they will not happen. So anything that was connected that going with your client to, to their, their professional association, you know, you're, you're, you're dealing with where, where they would go to get information about their industry. Those types of meetings may not happen in person the way they used to which means the opportunity to socialize with them at those events is going to change. You might accompany them digitally instead of in person. So I think, again, it, there's going to be a mix. It's not all going to go away. But I think we have to be very cognizant of the fact that our, our, our clients, our corporate clients, um, there may not be the willingness or the opportunity or even the availability of a budget to travel and go to conferences like they used to. So there, it may be more of a digital environment and we're gonna, if we wanna to get together, it's gonna to be outside of those types of settings, which is where a lot of this took place. And, he, and there's a question from the audience. Um, clients have gotten used to uh, interfacing remotely through Zoom or these other devices. Mm -hmm. um, and it saves them a lot of time. Mm -hmm. So do you think that the clients are, now that they've experienced this and know what they've been missing to Robin's point, are going to want to continue in being able to have focused, non-travel related interactions with their lawyers? And if so, how do we make sure that that relationship is strengthened? You know, I think, I, let me just interject something real quickly here. We've, for, for the better part of the last decade, we've serviced, uh, surveyed firms and their clients, corporations, and asked similar questions where, you know, how well do you think you are innovating and changing your business models to address the concerns of your clients? And we asked the clients the same question. So we go to the corporation and say, how well do you think your law firms are changing their business models and adapting what they're doing to address your concerns. Um, it's like the corporate clients are on Mars and the law firms are on Venus. <laughs> they, there's, there's very little intersection in terms of how well you think you're doing and how well they think you're doing. Um, they look at you as lagging generally in terms of changing your business models um, advancing the things that they think are important to, to address how they would like to engage with you. Um, so I think that that is that as a backdrop, um, I would just urge firms to really amp up your antennas and listening to your clients. Um, and if you're not getting good input from your clients about what they would like, go bold, ask them. Be real, no, I'm serious. Be direct, go out and say, what would, how would you like to engage with us? And how does it vary based upon, as, as Marie and, and Robert talked earlier about, the, about you know, the location and the practice setting and the particular issue that we're engaged with? I think, it's, I think it's fair to ask because you show concern for their viewpoint and then address their, you know, then take their response and say, okay, how does that work with how we want to operate as an organization? So I, I that's just my sense of it is that, is that in the past, there's been a big disconnect between what law firms thought they were doing and what the clients observed that they were doing. And I think that this is an opportunity to, to bring those closer together by being more aggressive at asking and then responding accordingly. 
And then, and then Kevin, when Jim gets the answers to the next survey, maybe he can share them with all of us. <laughs> um, thank you, Jim. Uh, yeah, that's a good point, Marie. So we'll be after you, Jim. Uh, Robin, the same, the, the same question to you from the practitioner standpoint. Well, you know, as analytic, analytical people, we do not want to hear that we didn't analyze it correctly, right? Um, so, uh, but good point. I'm not, you know, no, no, uh, I'm not trying to say you shouldn't tell us that, Jim. Um, uh, you know, I, I do agree. We have to just try to figure out what works for the particular client in the particular region, like we were talking about before. You know, it's just, it's just a constant analysis of, of what we can do to make it work for everybody. And I do agree when we were talking about surveys before about, you know, um, uh, conducting surveys and anonymously, that's great, but there's nothing wrong with talking to people that, you know, by telephone and just saying, what, what do you expect? What do you want from me? How mm -hmm. can we meet your needs? Am I doing what you want me to do? Should I be doing it differently? Um, and just adapting when you get those answers. And Marie, your, thank you, Robin. Marie, your thoughts? Yeah, I, I mean, I think I, I agree with what's been said. I'm not sure uh, there's a magic, uh, you know, a magic bullet or a magic answer. Um, but I, I'm certainly not afraid to ask, so that's a good sign if that's what we're supposed to be doing. <laughs> um, I, I had a, when I was a, a baby lawyer, someone once said to me, you have to learn how to ask for the order, meaning to go get the business. Um, and now uh, it, it applies in this circumstance too. So I'm gonna have to take my own advice. <laughs> and, and just for, 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 for all of you, if you want to, again, this isn't gonna cost you anything. Um, if you go to our website and go under articles and resources, law firm surveys, look for law firms in transition. And we've got every survey from 2009 to 2020 up there. You can download them, uh, look at them. You get a nice longitudinal look at it because some of these questions are consistent from year to year. So you can see how the things have changed and um, you might find some things in there that are helpful for you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. And, and Ryan from, uh, your company from Cushman and Wakefield surveys, have you seen anything in those surveys that would add to this discussion about how law firms are going to be catering to their clients in the, in the next stage? Yes, uh, and I think it's been touched on uh, this entire time or the panel today, but maybe not even addressed directly, but technology has been probably one of the most prominent topics for law firms over the last 18 months. Uh, law firms were thrust into having to increase their technology spending like never before in the work from home environment. But what we're seeing and hearing from our surveys and anecdotally from our um, clients, our law firm clients, are uh, that clients want more um, technology-based solutions and advisory. Uh, and the big question has been, how can law firms um, start to innovate to deliver certain solutions to, with, with, with using technology? There's a lot of um, companies and vendors out there that are thinking through this from utilizing artificial intelligence and, and other aspects that are of technology that are affecting so many other industries. Uh, there's now companies out there that are thinking, okay, how can we um, how, how can we implement these, uh, the, these, these items into the legal sector? So from a client standpoint, the demand for more technology solutions, not just communication technology, but technology solutions is a topic we've seen arise. And to that point, overwhelmingly, the majority of law firms we survey expect their technology uh, costs to increase. And in fact, we anticipate and predict that now, right now in the stack of law firm expenses, you have people, number one, real estate, number two, technology, number three. Most of our surveys, the law firms anticipate that technology will overtake real estate at some point in the next 10 years. So um, whether, it doesn't that's for, whether it's good or bad for my business, I don't know. <laughs> if, if it doesn't, you're doing on it. 
someone will if, pay me hopefully. If, but. If, you know, think of it this way: you're we're, we're talking to you know a, a, a group of large law firms who probably serve large corporations um, who have rather significant budgets and resources behind them to develop the kinds of tools that Ryan is talking about. And if law firms don't build it for them, they'll build it for themselves. Mm -hmm. That's right. And, and an increasing theme that we also hear is the, uh, the, the entrance of consulting firms into the legal field. Uh, and, and taking on some certain legal type solutions by utilizing their practices and their technology. We've, we've seen that big accounting and consulting firms are, are definitely standing up departments to compete with law firms. And um, well, thank you all for that. And an audience member wanted me to point out that Mike, uh, like Jim's company, uh, Altman Weil, Ryan's company, Cushman Wakefield, has their surveys online. So between the two of them, you'll get a nice feel for uh, where law firms are going. Great. All right. So we're at 520. I, I'm going to give a last call to any audience members who wish to submit questions. Um, uh, so we'll, 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 just, we'll, uh, we'll have one last question for the panel. We'll, we'll answer any questions that come through between now and then. And I think we're going to call it a night. So I guess the, the last question then, which is something that is, a, is a, a focus of mine, or at least as an observation of mine. Um, it, it, I think a lot of people were concerned in the pandemic era that it was gonna be more difficult to develop business or just continue relationships. Uh, my personal experience, and I think others I've spoken to is that because Clients are so much more are so much more willing to engage remotely that it's actually been more efficient to develop business in less time than it had been pre-pandemic. I don't know if that's an experience that you all have had, um, or whether you think that's a trait that law firms can benefit from uh, going forward. been my experience that's been your so, experience that's been my experience not, yeah, not, only, not only more efficient for business development but more more efficient for them to to service their clients they can be they can do something in the morning on the east coast and be and do something in the afternoon on the west coast and be digitally present yeah and you remember that uh, old adage about you need seven touches with somebody to get a new matter or a new client from them or something you know in, in seven different ways and mm -hmm. you don't need that anymore <laughs> i think if you're in front of them and and you can uh, interact in a way that works for them um and i think in in adapting and using technology and being present in these more difficult times people appreciate that um and i think we see that in a, a thank you with new business with new referrals for business things like that so we've had a positive experience that way well thank you marie robin i i agree and you know it's right now i think we're still a little um stuck in in still whether we call it a pandemic or we're not really out of it yet and so people are still um they have a desire i think to get together um and so, but I think once we go back to the new status quo, uh, that there, that we will see that, you know, business can be developed remotely and that our, that our clients like it and appreciate it. Um, but hopefully we'll also want to see us every once in a while too, in person. <laughs> so it's still going to be about relationships, which I think Marie mentioned earlier, just how we continue to develop those relationships. One last question, and then we'll call it a night. Uh, one of the audience members asks, you know, for smaller firms or solos, uh, what opportunities does the panel foresee as far as business development uh, in the post-pandemic era? Uh, how about if I start that since I'm um, now in a smaller firm than when I, I used to manage a larger firm? <laughs> yeah, please, Marie. And I would simply say that my experience in making that transition uh, and starting my own firm after leaving another was the relationships with other lawyers uh, that I didn't expect to yield so much fruit in terms of business 
uh, when I uh, started the new firm. And um, it could be based on practice areas, but the ability to have other lawyers say to me, I didn't think when you were in a bigger firm, that was something that could, you know, you, you, could, you could do or they would let you accept. But when I was in my own shop, it was a much more open um, line of, of uh, wanting to send business my way. So for a small practitioner, a solo practitioner or a small firm that's special, likely more specialized, you know, I think getting out among your community of the lawyers uh, to let them know what you can do um, is useful. And if you have a method to do that because technology is so helpful now and you've learned how to be more flexible, then you can add that to the reason why you could be a great referral source for other people. It was just something we found a, a surprise is a surprise to us. And, and I would just supplement that by saying that I think the technology has leveled the playing field so that small firms and solos can use the communication technology to reach out to a larger geographic area for, retain, for attracting and retaining clients. If you have a specialty that you are focused on, it gives you a better platform for letting lawyers or potential clients know about your specialty. And because clients are now used to this technological engagement, the size of your firm or the outward facing, the client facing spaces don't matter as much anymore. So I think it, I think it levels the playing field and is encouraging for solos and small firms. That's a good point. Okay. All right, um, it's now 527. I wanna thank everyone on behalf of the panel and the, and the Pennsylvania Bar Association for joining us today. We hope that you found this discussion uh, insightful. It's been recorded, so it will be available, I understand, through the PBA. For, uh, so if you have other people who you think would be interested in this discussion, please let them know, and it will be at, available to them for free. And we thank you for your time, and I want to thank the panelists, Jim, Marie, Robin, thank and you. Ryan. Thank you for all your time and your you. wonderful insights tonight. Thank Enjoy you, Kevin. Thank you very Great much. Job. Appreciate it. Be well, okay. everyone. Take care. So, why don't